This Day in Sports History. And we're back with a special edition of This Day in Sports History. If you have listened to today's regular episode, then you know that this is the day back in 2007 when the Appalachian State Mountaineers pulled off the greatest upset in college football history with the 34-32 win over the Michigan Wolverines. I was there that day and was able to catch most of the second half. At that point, I was working with Appalachian State Athletics and was handling tickets that day. Well, joining me now is a guy who had a great vantage point that day, calling all the action for the Appalachian Sports Network, and of course had the great call of the final play in that game, David Jackson. DJ, so great to have you, man. Thanks for taking the time. Hey, first time participant, long time listener. <laughs> Hey, lots of free stuff coming your way for sure for being a uh, great fan of the show. Certainly appreciate it. Hey, so before we get started with talking about what happened exactly on this day, let's go back a little bit further. Appalachian State, two-time defending 1AA champions that were coming off a great year where they went 14-1. and That one loss in 06 was to NC State. And that was, was typical then and even now. Those money games or guarantee games for an FCS team – are financially important. And most of those times, those contracts are written years in advance. But that was not the case with the Michigan game. It did not come about until really kind of late, right? Yeah, that's right. It was about Valentine's Day, uh, thereabouts, uh, early 2007, when this game even became possible. And Jerry Moore famously told Jay Sutton, who is the uh, associate athletic director that was in charge of football scheduling back then, when when the interest that Michigan initially put forward came around, Jerry Moore said, make them tell you no. You know, do whatever you can to play this game. And initially, Michigan backed out. And then they came back to the table once again. And, and uh, about early March, everything was, was finally solidified. And, and uh, the team was notified that, that they were going to, to play this game in the big house. But, you know, it was, it was the first time that Michigan had ever played an FCS school. Uh, App State was coming off of their second consecutive national championship, like you mentioned, and, and brought a strong nucleus back off of a team in 2006 that boat raced just about everybody they played. 14-1 and that year, lost to a very average NC State team that if they played again, they might have beaten. Um, you know, they were, they were loaded. So it was always kind of a curious scheduling move. Why, if you're going to schedule an FCS team, do you schedule clear-cut preseason number one, the best one that, that's out there? Now, you could make that argument that we're Michigan, it shouldn't matter, but it certainly did by the time it was all said and done. You know, outside of the wins at, say, Wake Forest back in the 80s and the 90s, and uh, there was that close call in 99 against Auburn, there really, really wasn't that history. Uh, anything to give Appalachian State a sense that they could go into the big house and win on that big of a stage. But I, I remember as soon as that announcement came out, it wasn't just an excitement of playing at Michigan. There was an almost immediate belief that we were going to go up there and win. It wasn't just confidence. Everybody believes when you play a ball game, you're going to win it. But they truly, truly believed it. Yeah, and, and I think a lot of that has some some seeds from two years prior. Um, toward the end of the 2005 season, right before the team really kind of took off uh, on, on their way to their first national championship, they played a night game in Death Valley uh, down at LSU. And we're down 14 nothing heading into the fourth quarter of that game. Now, there were a number of key players that were on that team that graduated, but uh, Kevin Richardson was a part of that. Dexter Jackson was a part of that. Corey Lynch was a part of that. And those three guys would have um, amazing roles in the Michigan win. So I say all that to say that I, I think that they had done the intimidating atmosphere thing. They had been, you know, through the national championship experience and that, um, that, that win to survive kind of mentality had the close call with NC state the year prior. Uh, I, I think there was a, a, you're right. There was a confidence. And I think that came from, we're going to go up there and compete and see what compete means. If that means two quarters and we're hanging around, then that's fantastic. That's going to set us up really well to start this, this 2007 season. But if we could do a little bit more than that, now you're, you're talking about, you know, being an, an, an opportunity to be a program changer. There weren't a whole lot of people putting stock that far into it, but it was certainly a thought. I, I don't think that anybody to a person would say, oh, yeah, we thought we were going to win the game the whole entire time. But we expected to be competitive. Um, I, I think the entire program, everybody around it expected to be able to go up there and show something. 
uh, what that something was, we had no idea, but, but it would turn out to be uh, a something that, that changed a lot of everything uh, around this, this part of the country for sure. And of course, it, everything starts from the top. I mean, that comes from, from Jerry's belief that, you know, he's got the squad built to go up there and, and play a Michigan team. He always talked about, you know, they may have the size, but, you know, Appalachian State's got speed and that's kind of, you know, that confidence kind of swelled from that point, I guess, from him. Yeah. And, and the speed was at, at positions that you wouldn't necessarily expect to see speed. You know, the, certainly skilled players were fast. You know, we had a, a tremendously fast receiver in Dexter Jackson who, who ended up likely becoming a, a, a top NFL draft pick because of that, that catch in that game, that, that first touchdown. But, you know, he was, he was a, a speedy receiver. We had speedy defensive ends uh, and and really the entire front seven of the of the defensive unit was a undersized but but very quick group and that just seemed to match up well against your traditional big 10 big bulky but but you know slow laterally offensive linemen you know you're you're talking about you got to go back in history here a little bit and think that you know this is really still the advent of the spread offense so so it had not been as universally adopted as it is now uh, and Big Ten schools were were not in that arena, except for maybe Ohio State. So, you know, App had a little bit of an athleticism advantage. It, they were certainly giving up pounds, but what I think Michigan found very quickly was that App had closing speed on the defensive side. They had breakaway speed on the offensive side. And that just was not something that that particular Michigan team was built to defend and and ultimately ended up becoming their Achilles heel in the game. You know, when you have a unique opportunity to work in athletics like we did, you see a lot of the moving parts to make something like what happened on this day back in 07 become a reality. I remember strength coach Jeff Dillman and his role in getting those guys prepared and not just getting the guys in the weight room and making sure that they're lifting the weights and getting stronger, but there was so much more that uh, he did to actually get those guys ready to go up there that day. Well, and, and again, rules being different back then, the strength coach at that time in, in the NCAA-ness of everything was really one of the only coaches in, in air quotes that could be around the team. You know, this was back before skill development like we see now was, was something that was permitted during the summer. So Dillman was it. He was in their ear every day and he was the antagonist antagonist. He loved pushing buttons. And so he played, he literally pushed buttons by playing the Michigan fight song um, over and over on a loop for weeks. I'm not talking just for an hour or so, but but the entire time that the team was in the weight room, the entire time they were doing any kind of conditioning, you know, hail to the victors is blaring out in, in, in that locker room to the point where even staff was like, okay, we're, we're done with this, right? We can move on. Um, but, but that was, you know, he, he wanted to try to eliminate any kind of, of prestige or the, the intimidation factor that hearing that song that, you know, again, this is back when NCAA football was, was a video game that was in, in uh, mass duplication back then. So guys were used to that. They played with Michigan on their video games. I mean, they, they, he wanted to try to take the mystique out of it. So that was part of that. Uh, they trained incredibly well. One of the things that, that goes by as a, as kind of a subtle piece to the story is we stayed pretty healthy that summer. You know, there weren't guys that were hurt lifting or, or uh, any preseason injuries of note other than Scott Suttle right before the, the game, the starting center. Um, so so they, were, they were able to get guys like Pierre Banks, Jacques Roman, Armani Edwards. Those guys were healthy and, and, and did very well right up until the, to the run up to that game. And, and I think that, that played a part in it, too, because they were, they were, they were ready to hunt uh, by, by the time camp was over and they were done hearing that song. So let's go to September 1st, 2007. I want to get your first impression of walking into the big house because that was your first time being there, right? Well, so, you know, backing up, there, there was another significant piece to the story that, that I think sometimes gets overshadowed. And that was what happened uh, in Boone the Thursday prior to that trip. So, um, you know, Boone, North Carolina nestled in the Blue Ridge Mountains, um, you know, got a great climate rarely have the disruptive thunderstorm, but we had one that day. And this was back before App State had an indoor facility that they could immediately go to. So right before practice started on the, the day before they were set to leave, I mean, a massive thunderstorm, hours long, and they canceled practice. Um, so imagine canceling practice the day before you go and play, you know, your, your last workout. 
uh, before you go play this team. And this was at a time, too, where App didn't do any walkthroughs at stadiums. So the initial plan was to not go to the big house, fly into Ypsilanti, go over to suburban Detroit, stay in a hotel, and everybody sees it on the on the day, like like you mentioned. Um, because that workout got got postponed, they changed the itinerary. Team flew into Ypsilanti and went to the big house on Friday and had... Uh, not quite a practice, but more than a walkthrough. And and they were able to get shake that loose uh and, and get that out of their system. But but it was it was pre Michigan Stadium renovation, so they had let it go. Uh and and that part of it was a little bit disappointing, actually. <laughs> to go in there was like, I thought this place was a palace. It's kind of not. Um, but you know, then you see the block M at midfield, you you understand, you know, you're then just like anybody, you're you're playing highlights in your mind of people that have played games in there, um, and and watching them kind of run around in the field. So it was it was a an amazing um, situation to walk into. There were people tailgating already on Friday. Uh, you know they they had a very anticipated season on the horizon. You know they were preseason top five. You know a lot of guys came back. Jake Long, Mike Hart, uh, just to name a few. They were legit national championship contenders, and it felt like that. So by the time we came back around Saturday, fans were really hospitable. They thought they were going to get that win, so why not be? But, um, you know, it was early in the morning. We played that game at noon, and I remember, you know, sun was still rising, and it, it just had a had a feel of college football, had a feel of a college football season opener with something on the line that that was, was certainly going to be exciting for us to watch unfold. So 109,218, that's the official attendance for the game that day. And uh, it's a loud place. The game gets started pretty much like fans had anticipated. Uh, Mike Hart scores on the opening drive at 7 nothing Michigan. But what happened next was certainly not what any Michigan fan had anticipated. A 68-yard touchdown pass from Armani Edwards to Dexter Jackson. Third down and four, Armani to pass again, goes right side and finds the pass complete into open field. Now Dexter Jackson's pretty free. He's going to take this one all the way for the touchdown. To the house, to the house and the big house. And the big house goes quiet as the Mountaineers hook up on a big touchdown strike to Dexter Jackson. Great read right there by Armani, and Jackson just had man-to-man coverage, beat him, caught the pass, and then the free safety dove. You know, going into that that drive, I think Dexter's pass and that that play was an underneath route. He curled up through the seam and caught a ball kind of as he released up the seam. So it was an in stride kind of uh, kind of play. And he was behind the linebackers when he did it and and sprinted free immediately. Kind of, you know, like you're playing video games, he hit the turbo button and he sprinted away from traffic very quickly. That was the first visible sign of the speed difference. You know, we sure didn't show it on the defensive side. We're chasing people, maybe. I mean, we got to them earlier than than we could have on a six play touchdown drive. But but Dexter sprinted away, and and I say it caught everybody off guard because the defense had had given up that touchdown so quickly. It was like, oh well, man, we're down, and you're you're kind of going through all of that. Oh, here we go. We're about to get killed, and you know, hope we hope we're healthy for next week. And then, oh, oh, wait, we answered. And I remember when he crossed the goal line and, and, you know, kick the two points and tie the game or or kick the point, tie the game thinking, well, cool. We, we did that. We're here. It's seven, seven taking pictures of the scoreboard. You know, we have, we have equaled Michigan for now. And, um, and, and that, what that felt like an accomplishment at that point in time. And, and then just, you know, a couple hours later, now you're like, man, if we lose this game, it's going to deflate everything. And that was a really weird emotional place to get to in such a short period of time. Michigan comes back. They score to go up 14-7, to and then we move on to the second quarter, and the Mountaineers score on their first drive of that quarter. How important was it to tie it back up and deliver that counterpunch? Well, and, and the counterpunch had a, a big play in it, too. You know, So it was, again, showcasing explosiveness. I, I think if you don't score there, that, that's where it gets away. That That's traditionally where... In the old school, again, I'll, I'll say because it's a little different now with with you know the parity that the transfer portals brought. But in in the past, the FCS team has to play a near perfect game to win that game. In the first inkling of of disruption of that pursuit of perfection, the wheels come off and they come off so fast, especially when you're going against a team with the caliber of athlete that Michigan had. So to hit back to tie that game immediately 
kind of brought a reprieve. Uh, and again, it was like, hey, we did this. Now it's like, hey, we're going to be in this game at halftime. How cool is that? That's going to set us up for a great year um, after after scoring that that touchdown. But I think that's also about the time that it started to get in Michigan's head. Like, why aren't these guys going away? They should have rolled over by now. And not only not only were we not rolling over as a group, but you had a huge touchdown play, had another three-play 74-yard drive to tie it. Um, we were moving. I mean, we were, we were not being stopped offensively just as much as they weren't. So it, it was setting up to be a track meet in a game that, that nobody in that place, 109,000, like you mentioned, ever saw that coming at, at that particular time. Of course, Appalachian State was not done scoring yet. They tacked on another one with Armani hooking up with Jackson again. I'm not think they're used to practicing this fast-paced offense that we're running. Five wide on second and eight. Michigan creeping up some from the secondary. Armani sees the blitz. Cover touchdown. pass complete. This is going to go for another touchdown. Black and gold. Wow. The Mountaineers lead the Michigan Wolverines on the strength of a touchdown pass. And then Armani did it himself, going over from a yard out to make it 28-14. 23 to play second quarter. David Jackson, Hall of Famer Steve Brown, Randy Jackson buried on the Mass General Store sideline in a sea of Mountaineer fans. They can't believe what they're seeing. 21-14, Appalachian leads Michigan. 2.23 to play until halftime. Mountaineers with third and goal at the Michigan 6. Five wide for Armani in the shotgun. Gets the snap from Irvin, looking for some help. Now steps up out of the pocket. Whoa, run wow. for the touchdown. Touchdown. Touchdown, Ooh. Armani Edwards on the QB draw from six yards out. The Mountaineers have opened up a two-possession lead over the Maize and Blues. I'll tell you what, number 14 right now has got an S on his chest. He left from the three-yard line, airborne. Went over Another defenders. one of the the unsung things about Armani, you know, people will look at at you know his physical play in there, and you know he scored a rushing touchdown, kind of got knocked helicopter style right on the goal line. Um, he was incredibly efficient. This is the first game of his sophomore year. He started most of his true freshman season, um, but but you know this was a kid, a kid. I mean, he's like 19 years old, maybe. I think he might've still been 18 actually, who had been a, an all American freshman, all American at the FCS level the year prior. And you're kind of wondering what direction is he going to go? Is he going to take that ultimate, you know, step forward, or is he going to be a little bit lost in that? I was good. I've got to be good again for him to come out and, and give instant credibility to the offense lifted the team up. You know, there was the first time I think, including the season prior, that that Armani became the person that everybody rallied around. You know, he was a very quiet guy, still is uh, to that degree. But that 2016 was loaded with talent. You know, he didn't have to win games. 2007, that was the first time that game, second quarter, you could see, all right, we can we can now gather around this guy that's going to take us there. And Hans Batishon played that way. TJ Corman played that way. Dexter Jackson played that way. Kevin Richardson, um, you know, who's a senior then, still rushed for 85, 86 yards in that game. He raised the level of play. That wasn't necessarily the guy that you're going to think if, if this is going to happen. It's going to be the sophomore QB. You're thinking, okay, it's going to be the Kevin Richardson show. We'll be clock management. Armani was like, let's go. Tempo, boom, boom, boom down the field. And he did it more than once. And, and that really... Uh, you know, you're talking confidence earlier. That that just kept elevating the confidence with every play. Michigan tacks on a field goal, and it's 28-17 at the half. Now, Coach Moore, by his own admission, would say that he's really not a halftime speech guy. But I do remember that he did go into the locker room at half and deliver some words to the guys. Do you Remember what he said? Yeah, it was is all documented in that that documentary that Fox Sports did. You know, those guys were embedded in camp, which was also another crazy element to this. Um, Fox Sports had a, a you know kind of before hard knocks and all that a very hard knocks style situation going on in camp. So they had great footage of so many intimate moments along those lines. And one of those was the halftime speech. And he he walked in there and he said, "You are about to get what USC gets, what Notre Dame gets." You're going to get their best shot right now. Be ready for it. And and he's like, we don't need, I think he said, we don't need any pep rallies. I'm not, still not sure what that means. I think what he meant was we don't need to overinflate. We don't need to go in there and scream. Just keep doing what you're doing. Stay the course. I don't know how many coaches would respond that way because of the, the circumstances that, you know, you got number five on the ropes in their home place. The world is descending upon this game. 
you could see a lesser coach blow that out of proportion and and almost scare victory away. He was he was very much in in his comments like, y'all are doing fine. We don't we don't need to really address anything and don't psych yourself out. Just keep playing football. And that was the message. And and um, you know uh, pep rallies aside, uh, you know they they were able to take heed. To the third quarter we go now, and with a game like this. Uh, as the FCS team, and you alluded to this earlier, that there's this idea that you really have to play a perfect game. You can't make any mistakes. You can't do stupid things and you can't have any turnovers. But Appalachian had three turnovers on the day and they missed a field goal. Now it was a 46 yarder. It wasn't a gimme, but still they did not come anywhere close to playing a perfect game. Yeah, and, and this was about the time in the game, and you can go back into the second quarter some as well, where, where App started leaving points on the field. There was a drop touchdown pass that Brian Quick had that was was right in and out of his hands, uh, missed field goal, and, and you start adding up the points that you're, you're, you're leaving off the scoreboard, and, I mean, the game could have been over, essentially, at halftime. But, you know, also that, you know, Michigan scores a field goal to start out the third quarter. And, and I remember thinking, okay, well, they didn't score a touchdown. You know, you got to make a move right here. Um, you know, it's an eight point game at that point in time. You needed some sort of reminder to Michigan that, hey, this, this team was handing it to you for the first 30 minutes. They're going to do it again. And when you let those opportunities go again, you know, to your perfect game analogy, that's where doubt starts to creep in. And and it's impossible, I think, in that kind of situation, again, where you know that the two teams are not equal to one another physically, you start to go, here they come. You know, this is where we're about to see the number five team in the country right now. And there was a play, um, Leonard Love intercepted Chad Henney, fairly deep, not uh, inside the red zone, but not far inside the red zone, um, intercepted Henney, and, and returned it a, a decent amount. And that was the point. It was like, if we lose this game, this is going to crush us. We might not win a game the rest of the year. Because that was like the, they should be beating us by now. They should have taken control of this game by now. And Henny still throwing interceptions in the third quarter. It was like, okay, maybe, maybe not. Maybe, can we, can this game end? How quickly can we get this thing over? And, and unfortunately, you know, from that perspective, that's when Michigan played their best defense of the game from, I'd say about mid third quarter on till that last drive, they were, were unstoppable. I mean, they were putting pressure on Armani. They were stopping the run game. They did everything perfect to get back in the game. Like they did. The teams exchange field goals and it's 31 to 20. And then Michigan takes advantage of one of those Appalachian turnovers and they score a touchdown. It's 31, 26. Now, they elected to go for a two-point conversion here, and they did not get it. Are you a little bit surprised that Michigan decides to go for two right there? Yeah, it felt early. Uh, you know, that was that was late in the third quarter. It, it felt early to 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 be doing things that felt a little bit more like desperation, like you're you're trying to put as many points on the board as you can. And I, I realize when you're down that that that's part of it. But you play the odds of football, and you figure, all right, fourth quarters we're going to wear them down you know, again, play the, play the circumstance out. And I, I just felt like that was a rushed decision, but that was one of a, a few calculated decisions that seemed odd. Like that was a period of time still when Michigan routinely took my cart out of the game. Um, he rushed for 188 yards in that game, had over eight yards per carry in that game. And they kept taking him out. Um, they, they put Brandon minor in and, and when minor came in, we stopped him. Uh, when Hart was in, we didn't. And, and so you add up not playing your best player along with kind of desperation point moves, especially at, at times where it just felt like it was premature. It was like, are, are, are you in their psyche so much that they're really starting to second guess themselves? It was, it was not Michigan's finest game plan. I think they would admit that and, and have since then. The, the unfortunate part of that was the app couldn't take advantage, you know, with a missed field goal or, or missed uh, two point conversion. You thought, okay, you score here. Now you're now you could really swing momentum back the other way again if you could make them pay. And that unfortunately is when App got a little careless with the football um, there in the fourth quarter and, and nearly cost themselves a game that way. To the fourth quarter we go, and the dream is still alive for the Mountaineers, up thirty one twenty six. Then with under five to play in that game, Mike Hart rips off that fifty four yard touchdown run to give Michigan the lead back. And you know it's that. 
um, you kind of feel that proverbial wind go out of Appalachian sails at that moment, right? Yeah. So we've got an audio file of the last five minutes of that game. And, uh, and that's about where it starts. Uh, Hart scored that touchdown about four and a half minutes left. So I remember that one of the things that I said, right. I mean, right before that run was, Hey, no matter what happens in these last five minutes, you got a really good look at what this team can be against a team that's supposed to be contending for a national championship. I'm trying to set people up for the letdown that's about to come, right? Or maybe set myself up. And and I, I think you're you're exactly right about the air being let out. It was an incredible emotional blow for everybody involved. And it was because of the way the run went. No matter what happens in this last 451, we've got a pretty good football team and a team that got better out here today. I formation behind Henny. Hart is the setback. It'll be a handoff Hart. Left side run through one hole across midfield to the 40-yard line, trying to turn it down. Still on his feet. He's got one man to beat as he reverses field toward the 20, toward the 15, trying to sidestep past Rose and will work past him into the end zone for the touchdown. Mike Hart from the 46 with a 54-yard touchdown run to surge Michigan ahead. This wasn't just a guy busts through the hole and runs 54 yards untouched. He goes left side, cut back, middle, cut back left, cut back right across the entire field and scores. I mean, it was a zigzag if there ever has been one. And we just kept missing. Uh, and, and guys were just so exhausted. You could see it in the way they were trying to trying to hem him up. But it was the 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 nature of the way the play developed that was like not only was that a, a you know big play puts Michigan ahead, but it was a you know, we're just playing with you now. This guy's fresh. Maybe, maybe then it looked good that they were resting him some. Um, but, but it just looked like for the first time all day that app was completely out of gas. This guy comes and carves him up, takes the lead. That's it. And that was just like, like unplugging the vacuum cleaner when it's on it. Just like, pew, it was done. Yeah. And we were, we were done. And, um, and, and that was, that was so late. You know, I told you a, a few minutes ago, kind of felt like there was that moment where it's like, man, if we lose this, this is going to be soul crushing. That's when that started to set in. Like, oh, I'm not, I'm not going to know a hurt like this one ever because it was right there. And little did we know, you know, there was still more to play, but it didn't feel like it right away. Um, you know, the, the, the even sadder part to that story uh, is that right after that touchdown, Armani goes out and throws an interception immediately to start the next drive. Armani in the gun, looking for someone, throwing that ball downfield, and it's picked. 43-yard line, threw it right into the hands of Brandon Engelman. And T.J. Cormer was wide open on the curl route, and again, he just led him like he thought T.J. was going to continue the route and run a square in, and just a poor throw right there. Got a little bit of a pressure, did a good job standing in the pocket, and just made a poor throw. 425 to go, and that one's going to be a tough one there for the Mountaineers. Down one. Armani's second interception of the day. Um, yeah, forced to pass. Uh, Steve Brown, our color analyst, said it was the, the first bad pass he had thrown all day, and he, he was really right about that. Um, you know, didn't see a linebacker, got picked off. Um, and so now you're really done, right? They've got the lead and the ball, less than four to go. This is icing on the cake. And then they couldn't score. It was it was crazy. It was, that, that five minutes of play took 20 minutes of time, give or take. And it was without question, the most up and down emotional situation in a broadcast booth I'd, I'd ever been in in my life. Mountaineers get the ball back a little over a minute to play in this one. They've got no timeouts. They're down one and they really go on maybe their most impressive drive of the day. Yeah. And, and got the ball back on a missed field goal. Uh, you know, so I mentioned Armani got picked off. They, they, you know, kind of fumbled it around a uh, minor went for a third down and short. I, I want to say it was a third down and three and he got stopped. So they kicked a long field goal and Brian quick blocked that kick. All righty. It's going to be a field goal attempt. Ball spotted at the 33 in Jalan to do it from far hash. Kicking right to left. Good snap holds down. Kick's blocked. blocked. It's blocked. The kick is blocked. Let it go. And, um, you know, was like okay so so not only did app get it but they got it a little further upfield so um you know you're right our, the the app offense had been stymied i'd said that that michigan had played their best defense of the day from from really early in the third quarter on through through this last drive in the fourth and it was 
you know, first a run play, uh, one of the most important plays in the game. There's a sideline pass over to the right. TJ Corman caught the ball. TJ was a great utility receiver, kind of a slot guy, could play summit running back if needed. But but quick slot guy makes a move on the sideline to his left and eludes a tackle and then ends up picking up about another 11 yards. The, the defender was setting up for a sideline hit out of bounds and TJ just stopped short and that hesitation move allowed him to get into Michigan territory. Five wide, three to the left on second and 15 from the Mountaineer 40 yard line. Armani in the shotgun, gets the snap. Pressure coming, fires it off. Pass complete to Corman. Side steps one tackle there. He goes across the 40, pushed out of bounds at the Michigan 40 wow. yard line. First down, black and gold, 115 to play. What a play by TJ because he- That sets up the, the over the top play to Coco Hillary. So it was almost like back in the second quarter when it was Big play, big play, big play. Michigan hadn't surrendered that in a while. Five wide for Armani. Possess the football. Shotgun snap set to come. It comes to him, Armani, with time. Now rolling out in the pocket. He's got a man open. He's got that pass. Wow. Coco with the 15. Take care of the ball. Take care of the ball. To the 10. Five down to the four. line. Coco Hillary. Wow. Inside the five. Clock stops to move the chains. So now your heart rate starts to go up again. And, and, you know, you can feel your, your heart in your throat thinking, you know, you're watching the time. You know that we're under a minute now. You have no timeouts left. Now it's it's about a turnover, and and App had had slippery fingers uh, in the second half of that game. So I, I remember saying very clearly, possess the football, um, because it was like you can't get down inside the red zone, especially after Hillary caught that pass and cough it up now. And I think that probably played into, and I never really asked this question of why they were so quick to go for the field goal. Um, you could have probably run a play, spiked the ball, and then kicked. You also saw your team coughing it up all over the place there for a while. So I'm sure that that was part of the calculation that, that Jerry Moore and his staff had of let's kick now. Let's, let's use the, one of the most sure parts of our game, senior kicker, senior snapper, um, senior holder. Let's just be done with this. And, um, and, and it was almost too, too, too much time left, um, you know, with, with 30 some seconds left in the game. All right. Oh boy, field folks. goal right now. Here we go. We're going for the field goal right now. 30 seconds to play. Julian Roush to give the Mountaineers a two point lead if he makes it. He's at the 14 yard line, so a 24 yard field goal, just like every day. Good snap, hold by Hunter Stewart. The kick is on its way, and it is through the uprights. Through the uprights, the Mountaineers have retaken the lead with 26 seconds to play. It wasn't pretty. Uh, he would say <laughs> that. He's in the Hall of Fame now, so we can we can say that uh, at, at App he is. But but it was a low liner. He he got it up, but just got it up. And uh, and yeah, so so App App is up, um, but it's not over yet. And and they've got too many weapons to to think that it is. So we're all riding that emotional roller coaster. Appalachian leading, and now they weren't, and then they are again. And here we go, 24 seconds left in the game, looking pretty good until Chad Henney hooks up with Mario Manningham for that long strike, and it sets up that 37-yard field goal try. And at that point, you go, well, it's it's been nice. Yeah, yeah. And, and, you know, you go back to the the Mike Hart play that, you know, the defense looked like that again where, you know— Offense may have come out there and been energized and took the lead back, but that defense was worn slap out. Um, you know, 20 minutes. It was a hot day. They they had, um, you know, uh, there was a pretty significant second half um, differential in time of possession, and it, it showed. So they go over the top uh, to Manningham. He catches that ball with ease. Had he been maybe another half step to the inside, he may have been able to break that free. Kind of got nudged out of bounds as as he or, or got nudged down. Um, short uh, out of bounds right as he made that catch. So Michigan calls the time out there to even throw more salt into sitting there watching this, this winning play set up. Um, but, you know, you go back to, to the importance of, of that summer period again, um, you know, and the camaraderie of a, of a veteran team that had won a lot of football um, in 2006. And I can't remember the number right off the top of my head, the, the special teams coordination that year, was pretty special and they, they actually got back into the habit of blocking kicks, putting a lot of pressure on, on kicks. There was a, a game uh, against Furman uh, in 2006 where we're at blocked a field goal and ran it back for a touchdown 
right at the end of the first half that was the the backbreaker in a, a traditional rivalry game turned into a blowout. Well, they call the Furman block play um, not only where we're quick blocked the first field goal, but they called it again. And that gives Pierre Banks and Corey Lynch freedom to take each other's spot. Um, Banks was lined up. He should have been the one to block it. Corey saw a check. He called Pierre off. They switched that, that assignment and that allowed Corey to get free to the football. But it was, it was a play that had been run to perfection a year earlier that, that again, you go back to confidence in having old guys around you're talking about veteran players seeing a thing. And in that moment, not being afraid to say, that's what we do all the time. We're going to do this right now in a, de- a program defining career defining moment. It's just amazing that they still had the mental fortitude to make that decision. Before we get to that final play, let's talk about Corey Lynch for just a moment. He was always around the football and he seemed to be able to anticipate where the ball was going pre-snap better than anyone we've ever had one of the one of the program leaders all time in interceptions he was a physics major and and he used to always equate his ability on the field to being re- really smart in the classroom as well and and he was a brainiac i mean he was he was uh recruited by some ivy league schools could have gone that that route um ended up coming to app state and and he was you're right he was the ball hawk's ball hawk but it wasn't because he just had a, a, a knack for it. He he brought science into it. And, you know, you'd talk to him after a game and he'd say, well, you know, I noticed the arm angle of the quarterback and that projected that this is where the ball was going to go. Was like, How can you see that? <laughs> you know, um, but but yeah, he was he was so intellectually superior to begin with. You bring that over to the football IQ side. And he was just right place, right time. He would tell you that oftentimes he was not the best defensive player on the field. Um, his numbers would bear that out because he'd have a high interception total. Um, you know, he he didn't love tackling all the time um, and and would use his his instincts to keep him out of situations like that. And he'd just pick things off. And uh, he, there's another, another kind of one of those, um, you know, crazy moments. He was injured in 2004 fielding a punt and and that was a new thing for him had he not been injured and forced to red shirt that year his eligibility would have been up in 2006 so he gets hurt i think it was the third week of the season right at the right at the borderline of of when you can still get a medical red shirt he doesn't go down in that year and i believe he broke his arm um if he doesn't go down that year he's gone and and who knows who knows who is there to to make that play so uh just just and, and then that means that's an older guy too. You know, you're talking about a 23, 24 year old kid making a play like that versus, you know, a, a wide eyed young player asked to go perform like that in the best moment. Wow. I did not. That's, that's amazing that you bring that up because yeah, he, the fact that he, he might not have even been there is, yeah. uh, is amazing. And I remember when he broke his arm, there was a lot of, why was he there to begin with? You know, here's your, because he was having an amazing start to his season. He had, he had a really great start to his career and it was like, You've got this guy that means everything to your defense and you got him out there returning punts. Why? And then, you know, he breaks his arm and, and was out for the year and that, that team could have used him uh, quite a bit if, if memory serves right. To the final play of the game now. And this is the call that so many have heard, not just App Nation, but all of college football heard on that day. Um, let's listen to it again and then I'll get your reaction of being in that moment. 37-yard field goal, this is it. This is it right here. Getting so ready. The snap's good. The whole block! The kick's oh! The kick is good! Oh! The Mountaineers are going to try to it's take it to the lead so. to the big house. Go to the big house. 20, 15, wow! The Mountaineers have just beaten the Michigan Wolverines. The Mountaineers of Appalachian State have just beaten the Michigan Wolverines in the big house. Oh, my. Unbelievable. It is Appalachian State Nation. We just beat the Wolverines at the big house. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Um, no, it was um, it was genuine. Uh, I think that's the best way that I can describe it. And, and you know, take a uh, quick step back. You know, I'm, I'm in the booth with a guy in Steve Brown, a longtime color analyst at App State. He was a, a player back in the late 70s, early 80s. Um, who was all-time leading passer. He was, he was the famous guy 
before App State football got famous. He was the one that people remembered. He had all the records. He had he had the success. To watch him react to that moment was incredible um, because he knew what it meant. He he knew he he knew it all, and and so he's losing his mind uh, as he tends to do, saying yard sale in the big house. And he brought that up prior um, after the block field goal that set up the touchdown that App went ahead. You know, we're, we're like, okay, I've got one more shot left. It goes, could be time for the yard sale in the big house. I'm like, oh, that's coming back up. Uh, so, so, so Lynch blocks the kick. Um, he screams first, you know, we both saw it at the same time. And, and, you know, the, the thing that, that we, you know, again, you're talking about, a watching something that, you know, is going to change your life as it's running down the field. So you, you kind of lose some of the ability to, to remain creative and, and, and do what you're supposed to do. So one of the things that we kind of screwed up in all of that is that we never told anybody that Lynch got tackled. Um, you know, he blocks the kick, scoops the ball and takes off. Um, and, and we're, you know, screaming, I think I'm like 15, you know, uh, 15, 10 the Mountaineers are beating the Michigan Wolverines. It was like, he, he also got tackled. Jason Gingell walked him down. I remember Lloyd Carr saying something, or maybe it was Mike Hart saying that is the definition of a Michigan man. This guy gets his kick blocked and it was the kicker that ran Lynch down, which of course he never heard the end of. Um, but, but so he gets tackled. Well, that, that whole thing you're watching go from left to right and, and Lynch gets to about midfield. You see the team start to spray out on the field as, as he continues down the field. Now you start to see the app section and people are starting to leak onto the field. Lynch gets tackled all the while this is going on. Brownie's going crazy. And I'm, I'm trying to say what I say. Well, um, when I said the Mountaineers have just beaten the Michigan Wolverines, I, I remember trying to convey that in a way that was like, holy crap. How can you say these words in a way that's like, oh my God, this actually happened. And there was emphasis that was placed on that, but you don't have any time. Uh, it was not like it was planned or anything. It was just like, this is what, this is what I said, right? Funny part to that. There was a ring down phone immediately to my right. There's a TV up ahead of me that I almost hit my head on uh, because it was really low. Um, and, and there was a ring down phone and the ring down phone goes down downstairs to the, uh, they have a, a, basically like a line of people, uh, that are doing hand tabulations of stats. Their computer stats by that point, but Michigan was so old school that they still had their stats guys and their stats guys are keeping the things. And, and if you had a question about, a way a play was scored or, you know, uh, a tackle or something, you pick up the phone and it's like the red phone that the president has, except you don't get the president, you get the stats guy and the stats guy's there to, to help you with anything. Well, I knocked the phone off the wall. So I know stats guy, if he picked up the phone is hearing me lose my ever living mind right there. And I felt bad about that. Um, but obviously didn't, didn't have the wherewithal to hang the phone back up. We just kind of let it go. We were, we were a little criticized after the fact that we, we lost it the way we did. Um, you know, there, it was, it was coherent, but not very, but I also thought that was the pure part of it is it was pure. It was not scripted. It was not, I mean, we couldn't script that, but, but it was our natural reaction. The natural reaction of, you know, me as an alum, longtime athletic department, um, employee starting to get the first inkling of this is all different now. Tickets, merchandise, the, the next week's game is going to be a zoo. All of that is like flashes right at you as this play is finishing. And it's like, life is different. And you got, you know, your former coach player guy over here feeling his emotions. It was emotional. And uh, I remember Mike and Mike ripped us pretty good. It was like, if, if you were in that same thing, if you were not detached, you'd have the same reaction. And, um, it was just, it was incredible. I, I remember Michigan left the field so fast. I don't know if you remember that they, they were gone in a hurry and, um, you know, just watching the team celebrate that everything that they've been through. Um, it was just amazing. It was amazing to, to relive it all. Now it always comes back at this time of year and it, it always, still all these years later will bring the hair up on your arms. If you think about it too much. Well, what's that like? What was it like to hear it the first time, uh, maybe later that night on ESPN or the next day on ESPN, and then to kind of continue to hear that year after year, yeah. that, that call and relive that moment immediately after the game, you know, you start, you're wondering, all right, well, you know, we beat Michigan, you know, text messages are blowing up everything. 
back at home, whatever. And, and, uh, I remember getting a call, you know, the, we, our, our board operator back in the studio gave, started giving my phone number out, uh, to, to people. And so I get a call from Freddie Coleman. Freddie Coleman is on with Mel Kuyper Jr. Uh, and, and they're doing their, their college game day show. And, uh, and it's like, Hey, Freddie Coleman wants you on now. And I mean, the, the game we're, our broadcast is still on. So I'm like, all right, guys, you take this for a second. I'm going to go do this. And, um, we were on for, I think we're still on the post game show from that game. As a matter of fact, all these years later, but it was like that after that game, we left so late because coach Moore was getting inundated. Armani, all these guys were, were getting talked to for so long. And coach set a tone very early in the post game of that. He said, we do not say no all week. He recognized the, the moment, right? So he's like, if anybody calls, you say yes. And that was for everybody included the AD, the chancellor, all of us. So phone keeps ringing, phone keeps ringing. Well, I get a call. We, we, we were going to the airport. I got a call from a producer at ESPN and he said, Hey, we want your play call. Where do we get that? I'll have my guy email it to you. And so they, they emailed it off. Well, the next, you know, so Papa Joe's Chevalier is on and, uh, on Papa Joe. And that was the first time I heard it. And I was like, Oh, well, where'd they get that? And I was like, Oh, they got that from us. Yeah, that's right. That's right. So, so the whole way back to, we probably did six or seven hits with people, uh, because it was the it thing coming back and, and hearing, you know, we were listening to sports radio and, and certainly we had been on the, uh, as soon as the plane landed, you know, they do their, their, Oh, you can use your cell phone. I mean, coach Moore was right back on the phone again. They charged his phone in the cockpit. On, on the way back, uh, no, no electrical outlets at seats at that point in time, but it was just like, we were on it immediately, um, driving back on these windy mountain roads where you never have cell service. And for whatever reason, the cell service worked on that night, but it, it was like that for a while. You alluded to it earlier that it hit you almost immediately about how our lives changed in that moment, you know, ticket sales, merchandise sales, uh, exposure, expectations, and Maybe I should have prepped you for this question beforehand, but if you take a look at what happened in the immediate aftermath, the crazy crowds we had in the following weeks, and then the stadium expansion, and then the move to FBS and another stadium expansion, we're 17 years on from that win at Michigan. Would Appalachian football be where it is now as one of the most respected programs in the country outside of Power Four Conference? Without that win at Michigan, let's say, you know, that kick is good and Appalachian loses 35-34, you know, good game, good showing. Are we still here? That is a great question um, because only nerdy sports guys like us remember who loses, right? And the, and the games that were close losses, nobody else remembers. And and I think that if, if Gingell hits that field goal, App State goes from you know, that team that, um, that almost did, you know, instead they're like football shamanade, right. You know, um, if, if that would have not worked out, I think the trajectory would have been a lot different. College football's landscape has changed so much that I think at some point in time, the powers that be would have seen that, that because of the revenue that FCS did not have, um, and because of the trajectory of, of what the subclassification ended up looking like, it was still going to be App State's best play to try to position itself. What, what I think is the great unknown in that is how the fan base would have responded to the loss. It would have been heartbreaking. And what would that have done to the team? You know, would that 07 championship have happened? Probably not. I think you could, you can make a strong case for it not happening. Um, you know, the, so I think that, that that sets it back quite a bit. Um, I don't think that, that, you know, certainly App became nationally recognizable. And, th- and that's that's kind of the understated part of the win, right? It's it's not just about having more enrollment. It's in, and, you know, a lot of excitement and that turning into building and selling more tickets and, and selling merchandise and all the things that we didn't really do a whole lot before. Now we're doing on this, this crazy, this crazy pace. But it was that, you know, not as many people had to be reminded of how to say Appalachian anymore. It was a nationally recognized brand. And, and the, the continued success, they were pretty good in nine, obviously made the transition up in 12 and, and it were immediately successful in, in the FBS, won several bowl games. 
that has maintained that national status um, and, and even elevated it beyond our wildest dreams. I don't think that if you, if you'd have told me even after the win that this is what it would look like now, I'd be like, wow, huh? You know, that, that, that's a lot, you know, that's a, that's a lot to, to keep up. And there were some years now, it wasn't all sunshine and roses after seven. I mean, it, we, we lost a lot, <laughs> um, lost, lost a lot. Uh, there were some tough years in there. Um, but, but the, the presence of the university, it brought, uh, increased enrollment. It brought a lot of eyeballs to town. We still, you know, all these years later, still get people that come in just to take pictures of the stadium. Stadium looks completely different, of course, but, um, that will always bring back things. I, I, I said a lot in the aftermath of all of that and still say today that, that it's seldom that something like that happens to a school where you've got a moment that you can't live down and it actually be a good thing. Um, it is, and, and maybe even some would argue that, that maybe long-term it, it wasn't such a good thing when you think about growth and, and expectations and things like that. But I think that, that for the most part, uh, you see the aftermath of all of that and, and you see what the program has become. And, and certainly the seeds go back to that. You know, App was good before. Um, they set themselves up to win that game because they were good before. I think that that, 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 that two-year national championship run, thinking that you're competitive for a third and then you know, maybe 2009, they, they break the ice and win that game instead. You know, that, you're still probably in the right, right space, but I don't think it would have been as smooth and I don't think it would have been as fast. So now you're the CEO and president of the uh, Boone Chamber of Commerce. <laughs> you know, we're probably about a five minute drive away from yep. campus at this point. How often do you get asked about that game from people that you talk to from around the state and, and points beyond? It's, it's funny. It comes up a lot professionally now because, um, you know, I, when, I, when I moved into the chamber, like nobody really knew, you know, who I was or anything like that from a professional standpoint, I was new in the role, but they knew, oh yeah, you, you worked at app for a while. Wait a second. You were, wait a second. Wait a second. Yeah. So you tell that story a lot. It gets brought up a lot. The, uh, the, the gentleman who's responsible for a lot of North Carolina's business success, his name is Chris Chung. He's the uh, president of the economic development partnership of North Carolina. One of the top economic development professionals in the entire country. Anytime I see him, he's like, App State, Michigan, he's an Ohio State grad. So, you know, there's a lot of that that goes on. Um, every year this comes up, you know, we did a, uh, we, we knew we were starting to get old uh, when we started doing, uh, a couple of years ago, we all got asked to be on a History Channel podcast. Like, oh man, oh, this is getting long, long in the tooth now. Um, so yeah, this day in sports history is bringing us back down toward the median <laughs> a little bit, I'm hoping. Um, but, you know, the, there, there have been... Every time any of the guys, uh, you know, and, and Julian Roush is routinely asked about things, Kevin Richardson, Armani, you know, Corey Lynch, of course, Pierre Banks. Um, they, uh, there's always something that comes up that somebody didn't know, you know, some, some weird little nugget of all of that, you know, coach Moore brings stuff out all the time that, you know, thoughts that he had that summer. Um, I don't think this will ever go away. Uh, every, you know, every August you can book it. Somebody's going to call, somebody's going to say, Hey, can can you jump on? Can you be a part of this? And that's again, where I go back to saying that it's so much fun to be a part of something that, that is so positive that will never go away. And app is always going to be known for, for that moment. And there's a group of us, you know, maybe totaling about 150 that were in that bubble at that point in time, um, that can honestly say, you know, no, we were really there. And, uh, that that's always going to be an in demand story. Uh, anytime that you can equate yourself to a moment like that, people are going to want to hear what your part was. I just learned today that you were in the stands. You weren't on the field. Um, that's pretty awesome. Um, so yeah, I, I think that, uh, certainly fans that were there and, and, you know, we can have that story. One of the, the last things I'd, I'd say is, um, it's funny the the conversations that you have and you remember over the years, Team Hotel is, is out near the airport in Detroit and uh, Julian Roush, who was the kicker that kicked the, the decisive field goal in the game, his dad was an early morning guy. Uh, and we always stayed at the team hotel and, and we'd always leave significantly ahead of the, the team. And any time we left in the morning, Julian Roush's dad was wherever the coffee was by himself in the lobby, just sitting there thinking. And so sure enough, you know, game kicks at noon. I think we left before the sun came up and, uh, and I saw him down there and, and I remember flying up thinking, you know, 
we're going to hang around. But I, like, I think that we got a shot to hang around a little bit because Michigan had replaced so much defensively. So I said to Julian's dad, I was like, you know, it'd be cool if this, this might come down to some special teams play today. Kind of like that, hey, your kid might, you know, I was like, not really fully believing it, but yeah, you know, that's what you say to the kid's dad, right? And anytime I see him, he's like, you remember we talked about that. I was like, yeah, we did. <laughs> Throw away conversation that turns out to be some sort of a profound statement on what what happened. But th- those are the things that I think will always, all of us will remember the flight up, the flight back, uh, being in that, that plane, knowing that everybody in the world wanted that team, wanted to talk to somebody with it. And it was just us by ourselves, not fully understanding yet what was happening on the ground. And certainly when we opened the door, when we landed, and then it was different from that point forward. And, and, uh, we at least had that moment with those guys. David Jackson, this has been fun, man. I know, man. I've had a blast. What other games would you like to talk about? <laughs> there were some that were clearly not so memorable. <laughs> uh, no doubt, man. Well, me as yep. the ticket guy certainly do not want to talk about the following week against Lenore Ryan <laughs> when we had people sitting in trees behind the hill, hill uh, that had not apparently paid for tickets. No, or maybe they had. No, I, th- I feel like there were some people on top of a concession stand at some point in time, too. But, um, well, yeah, and we were under construction. So we had, you know, temporary press box, a lot. There was a lot temporary for a couple of years. And the circus didn't stop, you know, that that next year in 08, you know, they beat Wofford on that crazy Halloween game. Um, you know, Brian Quick dunked the ball over the goal line or, or over the crossbar and then came out and chest bumped Coach Moore. Um, there was a lot. I mean, a lot of a lot of crazy stuff happened. And we were, we were right there in the epicenter of it all. It felt like that 07 season lasted about three years. Because it, it really lasted through 09. And even into 2010, I think App was like, what, 8 or 9 and 0? Something like that uh, to start that year. It was like, it's just all the same year. It's like some of the guys changed, but it felt like it was the same year. It was a lot of fun. I appreciate the time. Yes, sir. That's going to do it for this special edition of This Day in Sports History. I want to say once again, thanks to David Jackson, who was the voice of the Appalachian Sports Network back on September 1st, 2007, and called all the action from that thrilling 34-32 win for Appalachian State over the Michigan Wolverines. This Day in Sports History is a member of the Sports History Network. You can find more podcasts and more info at sportshistorynetwork.com. Have a great rest of your day, and I'll be back tomorrow with a regular edition of This Day in Sports History. Hey there, Sports History fan. This is Arnie Chapman a.k.a. the Football History Dude. And I hope that you enjoyed this recent episode presented by the Sports History Network and were able to learn some good old-fashioned sports history knowledge nuggets. I started the Sports History Network back in 2020 with the mission to help podcasters find a community of like-minded sports history nerds as well as helping aspiring podcasters to start their own shows. We have a little bit over 30 shows on the network right now covering all sorts of sports history. But as far as I'm concerned, We're just at the toothpick in the ocean moment, you know, that can't even figure it out because there's so much more coming. We wanted to create the ultimate headquarters for sports yesteryear, starting with Podcast Network and our website, but we're going to continue to move into other mediums as well. And here's the cool part, because we want you to be part of our team. So if you're interested in starting your own podcast, or maybe being a guest on one of our shows, or who knows, maybe even writing an article for us over on the website. Seriously, all you got to do is reach out to us on the contact page over at Sports historynetwork.com. You can be as technologically savvy as a Neanderthal tapping on a stone trying to figure out this whole hieroglyphics thing back in the day. Again, it doesn't matter because even if you don't understand the whole podcast space, we have a production team that can pretty much help you out with doing everything. All you got to do, head over to sportshistorynetwork.com, head to the contact page, fill it out. That message goes right to me and I'll reach out to you as soon as I can. But for now, dude, I'm through if you're through.